Look, in the 1990s, nothing was as cool as this dude, Apocalypse, and Sabanur, the big blue Egyptian dude who was disgusted with you. He was a toy, he was a cartoon, he was the centerpiece of the Age of Apocalypse summer crossover. He was inescapable. But despite appearing as the central villain in almost every form of 90s X-Men media, his chief achievement might have been taking over the Quake universe. Before we get too deep into today's episode, please be sure to subscribe to the Nerdstalgic Gaming channel in order to stay up to date with everything we've got going on. Black Mesa, Killing Floor, and Brutal Doom are arguably some of the most famous mods in video game history. There's a rich tradition of a hyperactive fandom taking over the ownership of a franchise and building a new and exciting creative project on the bones of an established framework. Much like how the presence of the Avengers in the MCU generated numerous threats and villains, so does an outstanding achievement in gaming serve as a call to arms for legions of hobbyist modders. However, none of these stories of a fan base taking over ownership of the game are quite as weird, unconventional, or lost to the sands of time as X-Men Ravages of Apocalypse. But before we get into that, we have to back up. Remember Quake? Released on June 22nd, 1996, the FPS game, created as the brainchild of Doom co-creator John Carmack, would set the burgeoning first-person shooter genre on its ear. Sure, Doom and Wolfenstein were cool, but Quake? Quake had moody atmosphere, pulsing music, and an ever-inventive weapon set that just made the game infinitely entertaining. Needless to say, Quake took the world by storm. And here's where the idea of being a fan and being a professional cross over in today's story. In 1990, an illustrator and sign writer named Johnny Gordon came into possession of an Atari ST and shortly thereafter became obsessed with creating pixel art. From there, Gordon got into modding games. His first big success was Bugs Doom. As you might assume, this was a Looney Tunes Doom 2 mod. Soon after, Quake came out and redefined how modders interacted with the idea of games modding. Gordon quickly realized that the capabilities of Quake far exceeded Doom 2 from both a graphical perspective and a gameplay perspective. The Quake engine allowed for new code to be added, enabling possibly endless variations of new additions. So what did he do? He decided to take the engine and attempt to bring some of his favorite comic book characters into the Quake universe. Initially, he played around with making Laura Croft or Judge Dredd, but eventually settled on bringing the X-Man Storm into the world of Quake. It's often said that the journey of a thousand miles begins with a first step. This moment, this would be the first step for Gordon. His fan-fueled passion and burgeoning technical know-how were about to change his life forever. This creative pastime snowballed for Gordon. After completing Storm, he realized that Wolverine would make a perfect excuse to utilize the body animations and attack patterns of the Fiend. Then, like so many of these projects go, he got the idea of making an X-Mansion and replacing the first level of Quake entirely with X-Men characters. There's nothing like seeing your favorite four-colored vigilantes fully realized and animated. This was exactly what Gordon was striving for. He was going to use the Quake engine to make his beloved X-Men move, the true next evolution of Xavier's dream. Okay, maybe not exactly Xavier's dream, but you know, still cool nonetheless. Early in this project, Gordon began promoting his X-Mansion rebuild in modding forums, and it rapidly gained momentum. Fans of both Quake and X-Men were whipped into a frenzy over the initial designs and rough animations that Gordon was posting. It looked so good, it might as well have been an officially released game. Fans across those early internet forums were all clamoring to play the game, which now had a name. The Ravages of Apocalypse. The game was generating so much hype that within a few days, Gordon received an email from Kyle Busquet, an industry pro that had previously licensed Quake from its creators, id Software, and had some connections at Marvel as well. Busquet inquired if Gordon would be interested in pitching his X-Men project to both parties as an official release, to which the obvious answer was, sure, why not? It's not going to go anywhere, but heck, couldn't hurt. Surprisingly, Gordon got more than a behind-the-scenes tour of the 90s Marvel bullpen. Both Marvel and id were interested, very interested, only with one major caveat. It couldn't just be one new level and reskins of iconic X characters. It had to be a whole new game, and it had to be available by the highly lucrative Christmas season, only three months away. In case you're not familiar with the ancient lore of the hallowed halls of the House of Ideas, Marvel Comics had just declared bankruptcy, chapter 11 to be precise. In order to stave off the forfeiture of all of their assets, 
they had to auction off all the rights to the film adaptations of their popular characters, which is how you get the X-Men, Fantastic Four, and all the other non-MCU characters ending up at different movie studios. Well, Marvel execs were getting dollar signs in their eyeballs when they were approached by Gordon and Busquette and immediately started planning how they could try and slow the sinking of the good ship Excelsior with a fully licensed X-Men themed Quake mod. In his naivete, Gordon agreed to the frankly insane timeline. He thought it would be no big deal. Three months to change some assets and come up with a new story? Couldn't be that bad, right? Well, the enemy of all fledgling creatives reared its ugly head, scope creep. In order to appease id and Marvel, the game quickly expanded into a 10 episode story that revolved around you, the player, inhabiting a cyborg created by Magneto and going up against a never ending onslaught of cyborg clone hybrids of, you guessed it, everyone's favorite Merry Mutants, the X-Men. Gordon, ever the soldier, thought the project could still be completed, even with the expanded scope. He was determined. He was convinced that he and his two friends had the passion, the drive, the willpower to make it happen. Yes, you heard that right. Gordon was trying to make this game in three months with only three people. This rapidly proved to be a falsehood. Thus, the initial team of three became managers and 15 more developers were brought in. Here's the other problem though. Marvel wasn't paying them more, so they were rapidly burning through their already meager budget to create the game. It was a race to the bottom on multiple levels, a race to the bottom of Gordon's production company's wallet and a race to the bottom of the barrel, which would give out first their stamina, the deadline or the money. All three were in short supply by the end of the three month development cycle. And there's nowhere this is more evident than in the finished game. X-Men Ravages of Apocalypse was released on December 5th, 1997, and it was greeted with universally negative reviews. Players and critics alike agreed that the game was just too hard, the levels almost had zero narrative arc to them, and despite the graphics looking great, the idea that you're just murdering X-Men for 10 levels is just a very strange way to set up an X-Men themed game. The game had basic functionality flaws, logic flaws, and level design flaws. To add insult to injury, characters like Rogue and Cannonball, when they fly around, turn virtually indestructible, which is thematically appropriate, but infuriating. The keys and in-game attributes vital to solving problems that linked players to new map areas routinely just don't spawn. And in an ever infuriating flaw, the ammo you have from all your guns is interrelated across weapons. Therefore, if you haven't been paying attention or just blasting people with your minigun, that depletion of ammo would mean for some reason you would also be out of ammo with your shotgun. Why? Because they made this game in three months with no money. So to sum it up, the game feels like an X-Men Quake mod that somehow tripped ass backwards and fell into a distribution deal. Today, Ravages of Apocalypse is a barely remembered aspect of the rather sizable legacies of both Quake and Marvel. The only reason why it was produced was in an attempt to facilitate Marvel staving off bankruptcy. The reason it sucks so hard is because Marvel was panicking and desperately attempting to wring money out of anything that looked even remotely like a commercial product. Overall, it's a shame that the game turned out this way. It could have been a really cool weird mod like Team Fortress or the Aliens mod. It could have been a fun, hey you remember that time style story. An odd but inherently fun piece of gaming and comics history. But it's not any of those things. Instead, it's a game that's so bad it's been doomed to the ultimate hell. No one even remembers it. In July of 2006, Ravages of Apocalypse was re-released as freeware, and the game's source code was put out into the open for contemporary hobbyists to play around with. And even after that, the game still doesn't have a significant following, because it just sucks that bad. Did Gordon and his crew go into this with the best of intentions? Yes, absolutely. Should they be blamed for how trash the game came out? No, absolutely not. But at the end of the day, it's the players who were getting ravaged by Apocalypse, because this might be the worst X-Men game ever. Okay, that's it for this episode. What do you think? Do you remember playing Ravages of Apocalypse? Do you think there will ever be a game that has this level of annoying trash in it? Like Cannonball being invincible when he's flying around? Let us know in the comments below. And as always, please like and subscribe to Nerdstalgic Gaming to stay up to date with everything we've got going on.